Hi, this is Dr. Bay, and here's Bugsy. And today we're going to go over reaction kinetics versus thermodynamics. So stay tuned. Organic chemistry. Taught by Dr. Bay. Reaction mechanisms. Reactants to products. Retrosynthesis. Target deconstructing. Molecules. Spectroscopy. Pouring through the sky. Triumphantly reply. Give rise to the complexity of life Living on a dream Across the seven seas Learning about spectroscopy Organic chemistry Thermochemistry is a branch of thermodynamics that deals with heat absorbed or produced by a chemical reaction, and most chemical reactions involve the breaking and forming of bonds. For this process to occur, it requires an input of energy to break that bond. So two ways that a bond can break are called homolytic cleavage and hydrolytic cleavage. Homolytic bond cleavage creates two uncharged molecules called radicals, where each species has an unpaired electron. And this type of reaction uses single-headed curved arrows called fish hooks. And another type of bond breaking event is called heterolytic bond cleavage, often shown with a two-headed curved arrow. And this forms two charged species called ions. But we'll mainly focus on the energy required to break a covalent bond via homolytic bond cleavage. And this is termed as bond dissociation energy, or BDE, which is measured using the change in enthalpy or delta H. In a chemical reaction, if the overall delta H is negative, this means that the reaction is exothermic and is releasing energy. But if the overall delta H naught is positive, then the reaction is endothermic and absorbs energy. So because most reactions are more complex and often involve the breaking and forming of several bonds, we have to take into account each bond being broken and formed. The total change in enthalpy for a reaction is called the heat of reaction. In this example, isobutane and dichlorine react to form 2-chloro-2-methylpropane and hydrochloric acid. For this reaction to occur, a carbon-hydrogen bond and a chlorine-chlorine bond in the reactants shown in green have to break. And if we look at the products, a carbon-chlorine bond and a hydrogen-chlorine bond shown in blue have to form. The change in enthalpy can be calculated by taking the energy of the bonds in the products minus the energy of the bonds in the reactants. And we can use bond dissociation energy, or BDE, to quantitatively estimate the overall heat of this reaction. So in this example, predict the sign and magnitude of delta H naught for the following reaction using the BDE values from the table on the right. Give your answer in units of kilojoules per mole and identify if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. So first, let's add up the total bond dissociation energies of the reactants in green. The cost of a carbon-hydrogen bond breaking is 381 kilojoules per mole, and the cost of a chlorine-chlorine bond breaking is 243 kilojoules per mole. This means that the total energy of the bonds in the reactants is 624 kilojoules per mole. Now, if we look at the energy of the bonds being formed in the products, it costs 331 kilojoules per mole to form a carbon-chlorine bond, and it costs 431 kilojoules per mole to form a hydrogen-chlorine bond. Both of these values add up to negative 762 kilojoules per mole. Whenever a bond is being formed, it uses energy, which is why the overall sign of this energy value is negative. Now, if we plug in these values into the equation where delta H naught equals the energy of the bonds in the products minus the energy of the bonds in the reactants, then overall, we get negative 762 minus a positive 624, 
which equals negative 138 kilojoules per mole. Now, since delta H is negative, this reaction overall is exothermic, so it means it's releasing energy. These values can be plotted on an energy diagram where the x-axis is the reaction coordinate and the y-axis is enthalpy or delta H naught shown in units of kilojoules per mole. Now after plotting the bond energies of both the reactants and the products, we find that the change in enthalpy is overall negative, so this is just a qualitative way of showing that the reaction is exothermic. And you can see that the shape of the curve going from reactants to products changes depending on the type of enthalpic reaction. If the reaction is exothermic, like the one we just saw, the energy value of products will be lower than the reactants, making the reaction exothermic, thus releasing energy. But on the flip side, if the energy of products is higher than that of reactants, then delta H naught is overall positive, meaning the reaction is endothermic and it would absorb energy. Now let's talk about entropy or delta S. Entropy is the measure of disorder associated with a system or a reaction. And the total entropy equals the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings. So if the total entropy is positive, the reaction is considered to be spontaneous. And there are two ways in which entropy of a chemical system can increase. The first way is by increasing the number of molecules. So for example, the reaction in this case starts with one mole in the reactants, but it forms two moles in the product. This increases entropy because there are more ways to arrange multiple molecules in the products. And the second way is going from a more rigid cyclic molecule to an acyclic or linear molecule. And this is because acyclic molecules have more freedom to rotate, therefore leading to an increase in entropy. Now, Gibbs free energy, or delta G naught, combines both enthalpy and entropy into a single value. If the equation delta G naught equals delta H naught minus T times delta S naught, enthalpy is associated with the change in entropy of the surroundings, while T delta S naught is associated with the change in entropy of the system. So if delta G is negative, the reaction is exergonic and is considered to be spontaneous. But if delta G is positive, then the reaction is endergonic and is not spontaneous. So to put this all into context, let's analyze the following reaction using the Gibbs free energy equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Since two molecules are being converted into one molecule, the entropy of the system is unfavorable. However, from an enthalpic analysis, three pi bonds are being broken in the reactants, while one pi bond and two sigma bonds are being formed in the product. Recall that sigma bonds are stronger, therefore lower in energy, than pi bonds. So this means that delta H for this reaction is negative, therefore the reaction is considered to be exothermic. And in general, enthalpy values tend to be much larger than that of entropy values. So for most reactions, the value of delta H typically determines the sign of delta G. But if overall in this reaction, delta H is negative while delta S is positive, what does this mean? Since entropy is dependent on temperature or T in the equation, the outcome of this reaction will be very sensitive to temperature. Below a certain temperature, the reaction will be spontaneous, meaning that delta G will be negative. But above a certain temperature, the reaction will not be spontaneous, where delta G will be positive. So Gibbs free energy values can also be plotted on an energy diagram, just like enthalpy values can be. So if delta G is overall negative, this means that the reaction is exergonic and therefore spontaneous. But if delta G is overall positive, the reaction is endergonic and therefore not spontaneous. In this reaction, reactants A and B are converted into products C and D. 
This reaction is overall exergonic and spontaneous because delta G is negative. But although we expect all of A and B to convert into products C and D, this actually is not the case. A and B are actually in equilibrium with C and D, and the changing concentrations of reactants has a significant effect on the value of delta G. So in the beginning of a reaction, only A and B are present, and as the reaction progresses, the concentrations of A and B decrease as the concentrations of C and D increase. An equilibrium is reached when there are no more changes in concentrations between the reactants and products. And this exact position of equilibrium for any reaction is described as the equilibrium constant KEQ. KEQ is defined as the equilibrium constant, which is equal to the concentrations of products divided by the concentrations of reactants. And the equilibrium constant can relate to Gibbs free energy in the following equation, where delta G equals minus RT ln KEQ, where R equals 8.314 joules per mole times Kelvin, and T, or temperature, is shown in units in Kelvin. So if delta G is negative, KEQ is greater than 1, and the products are favored in the equilibrium. But if delta G is positive, KEQ is less than 1, and the reactants are favored. So the thermodynamics of a reaction is actually based on the difference in energy between the starting reactants and the products. So far, we've seen that a reaction will be spontaneous if delta G for a reaction is negative. But the word spontaneous doesn't mean that the reaction will just suddenly occur. Spontaneous actually means that the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, where the reaction will favor the formation of products. Spontaneity has nothing to do with the actual speed of a reaction. But what does dictate speed is the study of reaction rates called kinetics. When we study the kinetics of a reaction, we make experimental measurements on a reaction mixture, determining how quickly product forms as a function of either concentration, temperature, and other variables of that sort. And the rate of any reaction can be described by a rate equation, where rate equals the rate constant K, times the concentration of reactants. And remember that a reaction is when reactants collide with one another. So if the concentrations of a reactant increases, this means that the frequency of collisions also increases. And there are three types of rate equations that dictate these collisions, and they can be specified by being either first order, second order, or third order. A reaction is first order when the concentration of reactant B is completely absent from the rate equation. So this means that doubling the concentration of A speeds up the rate of the reaction twice fold. A reaction is said to be second order where both A and B are present in the rate equation. And lastly, a reaction is said to be third order if doubling the concentration of A quadruples the reaction rate. If this is confusing for you to understand, don't worry because you'll see how all of this plays out when we get into the details of reaction mechanisms in the next video. But for now, as long as you understand the differences between first, second, and third order, then you're good. And there are several factors that affect the rate constant K. A relatively fast reaction has a large rate constant K, while a slow reaction has a small rate constant K. The value of the rate constant is dependent on three factors, energy of activation, temperature, and steric considerations. Energy of activation is the amount of energy from reactants to the peak of the hump in an energy diagram. A faster reaction has a small activation energy barrier, while a slower reaction has a larger activation energy barrier. So to summarize, Kinetics studies the rate or speed of a chemical reaction, which can be seen as the height of an energy curve, also known as the activation energy barrier. 
While thermodynamics of a reaction determines the equilibrium between the reactants and the products. Organic.